Good. Hello. Whatever time of day you're watching this, we're thrilled that you found this YouTube channel. It's Grace Community Church Online, Border City, Nevada. I'm Pastor David Graham. I'd like to welcome you to this time, and would you join me in a brief prayer as we begin our worship service. Our gracious Heavenly Father, praise and thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. We look forward to the holiday season, Lord, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And Lord, we thank you for your blessings in our lives. And now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts as we sing along with the music, as we hear the word of the Lord expressed. Would you draw us to yourself as you love to do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. like to share some announcements. Um, we're thinking about having a Christmas Eve service, but there seems to be some concern that we don't know how many people will come, and we're considering not doing a Christmas Eve service because of COVID-19. If you have an opinion or we, you would like to have one, would you please call the church office? The number is 702-293-2018 or 2018. Call the church office and express your opinion. We are going to be discussing that in an upcoming, uh, this coming Sunday, which by the time you see this, it may be Sunday, we're having a board meeting at uh, one o'clock. It'll be a Zoom meeting and you're welcome to join that. And so if you're seeing this before Sunday at one o'clock, then you can call the church office and connect by Zoom and watch what we're talking about. So, that's what we're doing. Thanksgiving, we don't have much planned at all. We are going to have a Christmas program. That'll be the Sunday morning.
prior to Christmas. So we'd like to fill the church up as much as we can with the COVID situation. We look, look forward to preparing that for you. There'll be a lot of music, singing of carols, and some special readings to help us celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Please join me in singing, Open Our Eyes, Lord, and Glorify Your Name.
Now I'd like to share some of our prayer requests. Don Walker is hopefully going to be moved into the veterans home here in Boulder City. It's a tough go. It may be he'll be entered with hospice. That's still to be decided at this moment. But would you pray for Don and his daughters, Karen and Susan, and their families as they have to deal with this uh, final passage of Don from our plane of existence into the glory of heaven to be with Barbara. Let's pray for him. I also have a concern for Mabel's son, Darren, who is struggling with alcoholism. He's been making some strong, positive choices and uh, planning to be baptized as a believer. And I know the Lord is working with him and drawing him, but he needs special prayer today. Would you remember him in prayer? And then there's Louise Aldrich. We heard that she's been taken to the hospital, but we don't know which hospital she is, so we can go visit her. And I don't know how ill she is, but would you pray for Louise Aldridge of our congregation? And there are many more. I'd like to continue to remember my daughter, Allison. She was diagnosed with uh, a rare blood disorder. And uh, would you pray that the Lord would heal her from that, dear Allison? So let's pray. Would you join me in our prayer? And then we'll conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, we bring to you now the names that I lifted up, Lord. We pray that where healing is needed, you would release your healing power in their behalf in Jesus' name. Lord, I praise and thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Would you continue to honor your word as we stand in faith? And you said if any two agree asking anything in your name, you would accomplish that for us, Lord. Show your glory. Show who you are in our behalf by intervening in these situations that we bring to you. Lord, comfort the family of those who may be experiencing grief or loss right now. And we thank and praise you for your faithfulness. Now we pray the prayer you taught your first disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. like to share our scripture readings. The first one is found in uh, Isaiah, that's chapter 43, 
and I'm going to read verses 10 through 13. This is our reading for today's message. But you are my witnesses, O Israel, says the Lord. You are my servant. You have been chosen to know me, believe in me, and understand that I alone am God. There is no other God. There never has been, and there never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord, and there is no other Savior. First, I predicted your rescue. Then, I saved you and proclaimed it to the world. No foreign God has ever done this. You are my witnesses that I am the only God, says the Lord. From eternity to eternity, I am God. No one can snatch anyone out of my hand. No one can undo what I have made. That's the reading from the Old Testament. Now I would like to share the New Testament reading from the book of John, chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, my hour has come. Glorify your Son, so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me in to the glory we shared before the world began. This is part of Christ's high priestly prayer found in John 17. But it does include the text for this morning's message, which I want to share one more time. It's verse 3. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. It's very important that we have a personal knowledge, a personal intimate relationship with both Jesus Christ, the Son, and God, our Heavenly Father. on the Avon asked the right question to be or not to be that is life's call if we are to be then where is the meaning if living is better than to not be at all love fills my It's wings spread. 
baby crawls on four, a youth stands on two. He leans on a cane, three legs when he ages. But he must have love for life to be true. Love fills my sails, I ride on its power. Love like a gale that devours my soul. Love like a hurricane, its center at peace. Love like a morning dove, its wings spread full. Love like an Hello, I'm glad to be with you today. The title of the message today is to know the Father and the Son through the glory of the cross. And the text I've selected is a text from John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. This verse implies that if we're going to receive the full salvation that God has promised us and the gift of eternal life, that we must know the Father and the Son. What does that mean? We're going to start off by talking about the glory of the cross and the character of Jesus Christ. And uh, so I want you to listen carefully because this is a brand new insight for most of us. The cross was the glory of Jesus Christ because he was never more majestic than at the moment of his passing. Even though he had been flogged beyond recognition, tortured and bruised, his dying words and his concern for others shone through his pain and suffering. The death of Jesus Christ on a cross was like a magnet that drew men to him more than everything he'd done in his life could possibly do. And so it is today. In John 12, 23, we read, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Can you imagine him saying that while he's hanging on a shameful cross? So what does Jesus mean when we he says, enter into my glory or I will be glorified? There's more than one answer to that question. First, I'd like to share with you that uh, it is one of the facts of history that again and again, it was the death of great souls that really showed forth their glory, the quality of life they had. It was how they died that showed who they really were. They may have been misunderstood or undervalued, condemned as criminals even in their lives, but their death showed their true greatness. For example, Abraham Lincoln had many enemies during his lifetime, but even those who criticized him the most saw his greatness when he died. Someone came into the room where Lincoln lay after the assassin shot had killed him, saying, now he belongs to the ages. Stanton, his war minister, who had always criticized Lincoln and thought him as backwoods, crude, uncouth, looked down at his dead body with tears in his eyes and said these words, there lies the greater ruler of men that the world has ever known. Stanton, his most vocal critic during his life, recognized the greatness of Lincoln at the moment of his passing. Again and again, a martyr's death shows majesty. Think about the first Christian martyr, Stephen. 
In his dying words, he quoted our Lord saying, Father, forgive them. That's why they were stoning him to death. It was Jesus who was his example. He did not question the mock trial and the false charges, the cruel beating that he did. He did not scream at the horrendous pain. He endured it stoically, knowing full well the magnificent importance of his sacrificial death. Even the Roman centurion at the foot of the cross, who had just completed nailing him to that cross, said, surely this man was the son of God. A second insight in understanding the glory of the cross and what it has to do with knowledge of the Father and the Son is that the cross was the glory of Jesus because it was the completion of his work. I have accomplished the work, he said, which you, Father, have given me to do. By going all the way to the cross, Jesus showed there was nothing that the love of God was not prepared to do and suffer in order for men to be redeemed. There was absolutely no limit to his love. Think about that. No limits to the love of God for you and for me. A famous painting during World War I showed an engineer fixing a telephone line. He had just completed the repairs so that an important message could go through when he was shot and killed. The picture shows him at the moment of his death and beneath it there is one word, through. He had given his life so that the message, a very important message, could get through. And that's what Jesus did. He completed his task. What was the message that he got through? He showed each of us that our Heavenly Father loved us so much that even the death of his only begotten Son, though necessary to remove sin, was not too great a price to pay for you and I. Furthermore, Jesus knew that price and was willing to pay it. He knew the score when he uttered his last words. It is finished. It is finished. What was finished? The complete and total redemption of mankind, the forgiveness of sins, and the gift of eternal life for all who will simply believe, have faith that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. This finished work completely removed the sin of stain from mankind, thereby enabling us to experience this great gift we call eternal life. Eternal life. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe that when you die, after a time, at the great day of resurrection, the Lord will call and you will be reconstituted and rise in a new body to be forever with the Lord. In John 3, 14, 15, he said, As Moses was lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 12, 32 and 33, we read he's the same thing, but a little bit differently. And I, he said, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. This, he said, showing what kind of death he was going to die. He was going to be put up into the air on a Roman cross. By paying our sin debt, he made it possible for us, you and I, to live forever. That is an incredible gift from God's love. Can you imagine a God that loves us so much he makes it possible for us to spend eternity with him, enjoying him, learning from him? He's got such great things planned for you and I. That's truly a glorious work, and it was all accomplished because of the glory of the cross. 
But there's more to this. The cross was not the end, as you know. There was a resurrection to follow. And that singular event, unprecedented in all history, was the vindication of Jesus Christ. It was the proof that men could do their worst and that Jesus could still triumph. It was as if God pointed at the cross and said, this is what men think of my son. And then pointed to the resurrection and said, this is what I think of my son. The cross was the worst that men could do to Jesus. But all that hate and jealousy could not defeat him. The glory of the resurrection wiped out the shame of the cross. The cross truly was a gateway to his glory. If he had refused to pass through it, there would have been no glory for him to enter into and no glory for us to enter into. Can you see that? Now, there's a third key insight into this passage, which I hope that we can all understand. And it is this. It is the actual words of John 17, 3. It is eternal life to know God and to know Jesus Christ, whom he had sent. And this is the core thing that I want us to focus on for just a minute or two in this message. In Greek, the word for eternal is ionis. It speaks of not only the eternal duration of life, but the quality of that life. To enter into this life is to experience something of the splendor, the majesty, the joy and peace and the holiness which characterizes the life of God. It is qualitatively superior to the kind of life that we enjoy as human beings. I think it was the, well, I know it was the prophet Amos who reduced all of the many commandments of the law to one when he said, listen carefully, in Amos 5, 4, seek me and live. Seek me and live. For seeking God means seeking to know him. The Jewish rabbis had always insisted that to know God was necessary to true life. So then what does it mean to know God? Two things, knowledge about God and a personal acquaintance with God. When we understand through study and a desire to know more about God, we find that God's activity in the world is motivated by love for his chosen people. It makes a, a, a real difference, I think, in my life and maybe in yours to know that God is stern, but not cruel, that he cares greatly about justice and that his love is unbounded. Love so amazing that we can't even begin to comprehend that kind of love. That's the God that introduced himself to me when I was going through a very, very difficult time in my life. He actually spoke to me. He was aware of my perplexity. He was aware of my heart cry. Are you really there? Who are you? What are you like? And he revealed to me that he was love so immense, so stupendous, that even the tiniest little ray of that love, I as a mere human being would be incapable, was un incapable of even reacting or responding at any level to it. So God is love. That's what the Bible teaches us. And we know these things, but we could never have fully known them if we hadn't seen the life of Jesus among us, who came to reflect in a very visible way how God loves. And when we enter into new life in Christ, when we are born again from above, we begin to experience something of that life of God himself. When through the work of Jesus, we discover what he's like. It is eternal life to know what God is like. That's the first concept I want to talk about. Knowledge about God. Read about him. Read about him in the prophets. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The second idea is the idea of a personal acquaintance with God. Is that even possible? You know, all my life, people say, 
Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? And I always would think, what does that mean? What are you talking about? God is invisible. How do you have a personal relationship with an invisible being? But the longer I've read my Bible and spent time in prayer, this relationship is something kind of mystical. It's kind of like you enter into the very, the very ethos of God, let's say, and his spirit is poured into you to dwell within you, to give you a connection with that ethos. It's spirit to spirit, mind to mind, heart to heart. That's the way it works in this personal knowledge of God or this personal acquaintance with God. Marriage might be an analogy. The intimacy of heart, mind, and soul when we find true love enables the marriage covenant to be all that we expect. And it's the same with the Father. When you place your total heart to Him, when you give Him your heart, give Him your life, say, I surrender. Here, take me. Use me for whatever you want. I'm yours. I love you with all my heart. When you say that, it reminds me of that hymn in the garden. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I really like that. To know God, then, is not merely to have intellectual knowledge about him, but to have an experiential, intimate and kind of a personal awareness or relationship with him, which is and ought to be the nearest and dearest relationship we have in all of our life. However, without Jesus teaching us and showing us how, such intimacy with God would have been unthinkable. It is Jesus, the one who said, God is not so high and lifted up that he's totally unapproachable. But the Father, whose name we know, is a God of love. That's why when he taught his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, don't say something like, oh, great and holy Father, far above all knowledge, far of all wisdom and knowledge. And he said, when you pray, say, our Father, or my Father, personalize it. Hi, Dad. Good morning, Dad. What have you got? What do you got planned for me today? What are you up to? Can I be a part of it? That's the kind of relationship that the Lord wants for you and I. We need to learn how to become on intimate terms of friendship with him. Walking and led by his spirit. That's what it says, what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. If we are led by the Holy Spirit, we're the sons and daughters of God. It's a family relationship. Jesus said it this way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. So that's why we learn who Jesus is and, and Jesus and the Father. In fact, here's what he said. He followed that statement by saying, believe in me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Jesus was in the Father. The Father was in Jesus. Are you in the Father? Is the Father in you through the Holy Spirit? Amen. Christ's finished work on the cross makes it all possible. That's why the cross is the glory of God. It enables us to really know God, our Father, knowing that our sins are forgiven and that God will share his glory with us and with the Son and with us who believe. Amen. Try this on for size. Today, maybe later today, anytime, before you go to bed, try talking to God as if he was your best friend, because he is. Just tell him anything, what you're thinking. I do this on a regular basis. Come to think of it, he is your best friend. He has spoken to you in this great love letter called the Word of God. And I'll call, quote just one thing he said about you. The good things I have planned for you are too numerous to count. Think of that. 
The good things I have planned for you are too numerous to count. Believe these words. Then thank him and praise him because he has chosen you to be his daughter, his son. He loves you. Now, thank him and praise him and then learn to read the prophets. Why do I say that? It's one way we can get better acquainted with the Father. One way we can hear his voice is by reading Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea. Feel God's pain as you read these prophets, pouring out God's thoughts through the mouths of the prophets. Feel his pain when he sees his people ignoring him and worshiping other gods who aren't even real. Hear his broken heart and his lashing out even after all he had done for them. That's just one way we can begin to develop a deeper intimacy with him by hearing him, reading the prophets who are speaking his words and his thoughts. And then secondly, also allow him to speak to you in silence. Sometimes after you praise him and thank him, in fact, you know, Psalm 104 says, we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Two steps. Start with thanksgiving in your prayer and then begin praising him. That's how we enter into his courts. We draw closer to him through thanksgiving and praise. And so after you've done that, then be in silence and let him speak to you. Let him tell you how much he loves you. You know, it's hard for me because I know I'm nothing. I know I'm just one tiny little human speck on, on a planet in an entire solar system, in an entire galaxy. It's, it's mind boggling to actually understand that the God who created all that there is loves you, loves you so much that he has so much planned for you. And he's waiting for you to just to come and spend time with him. He loves you. Seek him wholeheartedly. In fact, there are many passages that tell us that if we would seek the Lord with all of our hearts, we will find him. In fact, I want to share one in closing. Here's what I find in Jeremiah 29, 11 and following. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. You see, that's the problem with non-believers. They don't look for God and they don't find him. You have to be wholeheartedly wanting to know him, to understand what he's like, who he is. And when you know him, you will have eternal life. That's what our text said. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Thank you, Lord, for the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for completing the work in my behalf on the cross. I cannot thank you and praise you enough for forgiving me of my sins and creating my future with you. This day, I do seek you, Father, with all of my heart and soul and strength. In your name I pray. Amen.